after the film has been produced, uh, there's often uh, revision done. Uh, and uh, whenever somebody writes a new version of a scene or some adds a scene that wasn't there before, when those pages are inserted into the physical script, they're in color paper so that when you see a script, you can tell which are the revised pages or the additional pages as opposed to the ones that were always in the script uh, to begin with. Well, they were, uh, oh, and, and at the top of such a colored piece of paper, you will see uh, the date uh, so that you'll know what date uh, that piece of material was added to the script. Well, they were changing so much so often on the Star Trek, the motion picture, and there were so many disagreements uh, so that they would change the changes. And uh, the uh, shooting script, by the time they were finished, uh, looked like uh, the rainbow. Uh, there were so many colored pages in it. And at the top of the uh, page, it would not only say the day's date, but the time of day in which it was inserted, because often that was the second insert or change made that say, that very day. Um, so it was, uh, and this was one reason, again, why the picture was so expensive, because they never really had a final finished script when they were starting. And that's what a production manager has uh, to uh, make his budget, uh, to base his budget on, is what's in the script. Um, but uh, again, it was rushed into production because of that darn uh, deadline that they had painted themselves into the corner uh, on with uh, December 7th. When you got to meet Jerry Goldsmith, did you go to his music studio? Did he play any of the themes for you? And what, what did you think of those? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that was one of the things I was most looking forward to because I'm such a, a fan of music in general. And uh, and he's one of the great uh, film composers, as we, I, I'd like to think we all know. Um, and I uh, visited him at his home. And I was very lucky uh, there because the day that I happened to have scheduled the interview, uh, the mailman had brought him uh, from uh, the recording studio the uh, tape of uh, the first version of the uh, dry dock sequence, uh, the uh, major early scene where Scotty uh, in that pod uh, is taking Captain Kirk all around uh, the new refurbished uh, Enterprise, um, a scene which is without dialogue and is entirely this gorgeous uh, music. Um, the, uh, the What happened uh, in the uh, pr uh, post-production work on uh, that uh, part of the film was that uh, uh, Goldsmith, who had worked with Robert Wise before, incidentally, on uh, The Sand Pebbles, uh, they had a very good working relationship, uh, but uh, um, uh, sometimes... Uh, uh, Wise uh, would uh, need a major uh, revision, and this was perhaps the most uh, uh, significant one uh, on on the picture. Goldsmith had uh, written and recorded uh, the complete uh, six-minute sequence, something like that, uh, and uh, it was very much in the, the mood of the version that we're familiar with now, uh, in the picture, but uh, Wise uh, felt that even though it had that sort of seafaring maritime feel to it, uh, that it was kind of amorphous, and he said he, he really need to tie this together to a, a concrete theme uh, and make it very uh, specific, if you will. And uh, as we know, he we, we wrote that great uh, theme that became the March theme, uh, the, the theme of the main title and the theme of Star Trek Next Generation, the series, and so on. One of the great uh, themes uh, of all a moviedom, I'd say. Uh, but I got to uh, hear the original version because, as I say, it had just arrived in the mail, so he put it on his uh, speakers for me. I'm happy to say that... Uh, a few years ago, uh, long after uh, the uh, film uh, was uh, released and the soundtrack LP had been uh, released, 
there were there now exists a three CD box with the uh, complete score of the film, including uh, outtakes, uh, which includes that major sequence that he played for me uh, in his living room. Uh, so now everybody uh, can have the thrill that I did hearing that first unused version. And it helps you appreciate all the more uh, the version that he ended up with at uh, Wise's uh, uh, instigation. I, I heard some interviews, um, there's some very rare interviews with Jerry Goldsmith and the difficulties he had in pleasing uh, Robert Wise with the music he, he had done because musically he had done great work, but there was something missing. And Well, that's exactly what I'm t I think you're talking mm -hmm. about is uh, mm -hmm. the story that he told me uh, mm -hmm. about that, the dry dock sequence. Mm. I love that dry dock sequence. Um, when it came to a director on the movie, uh, did you think that Robert Wise was the right director to helm the project? And this is only your own personal view because everyone has a view. Um, or would you, had you been in charge, would you have chosen somebody that you thought was more suitable? And, and you don't have to name who that person is. Or maybe you do. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, they had a list of possible directors. Uh, that they uh, hoped to consider at the very beginning, naturally, of the pre-production period. And Robert Wise's name was always high on that list, not only because he was uh, the complete filmmaker, but be it included uh, genre pictures, the horror movies he made with Val Luton in the 40s, The uh, Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, which from the... Uh, early sci-fi resurgence in the 50s, which is still one of the great science fiction films of all time. Uh, so uh, they definitely uh, were right to consider him. And uh, they, I think the actors were thrilled to know they'd be working with him when he finally was the one who was picked out of uh, the whole uh, list that they had been considering. And uh, I don't want mean to put you on the spot, but uh, I don't know if you've had a chance uh, to read my whole book yet. But I think it it should be very clear by the time you finish the book that uh, if anybody is the hero of this story, it's Robert Wise. And uh, I think if any lesser director, any lesser professional had been uh, sitting in the director's chair, they might not have gotten the film made in time for that December 7th opening. Uh, he uh, was a master of filmmaking and a master of uh, Buddha-like calm in the midst of chaos. Uh, he uh, never uh, would... Uh, rant and rave and get upset as some directors do and there was a lot that would have inspired uh, uh, the most patient soul to want to rant and rave but uh, he kept his cool through uh, uh, the whole process and uh, kept everything moving along and um, they're just dar damned lucky that uh, that they had him is all I can say because they really might not have had a Star Trek the motion picture without him. That's good to know. Um, it wasn't meant to be a critique of Robert Wise's um, uh, work or ability. It's just, I think, early reaction to the movie just connected him with his Sound of Music work. And the idea that uh, a director who seemed to be able to produce a wonderful you know, musical was now in charge of launching the Enterprise and and the dichotomy of that idea was kind of strange. And the darkness, the eventual darkness of the movie when it came out um, made people kind of question whether somebody else would have livened it up or brightened it up or done something to move the action along a lot faster, the pace of the movie along, you know, a lot quicker. So that that was really what was behind the... The question. So, well, it I, sounds like you're talking about two separate issues there, really, because uh, <laughs> uh, there's no successful musical that's ever been made that was uh, slow-paced either. Uh, and 
he, when I talked about him being the complete professional, it's because he had made every kind of picture. If you examine his career, you know that he not only did The Sound of Music and West Side Story, which was another oh, great musical, true. perhaps in its way even, uh, I would think, greater than The Sound of Music, but that's another story. Uh, he did films noir, he did westerns, he did dramas, uh, he uh, did, uh, as I say, the wonderful Val Luton uh, horror pictures. Uh, the Body Snatcher with Tarloff is a great personal favorite of mine. Um, he was a master. Uh, and uh, then we get into the second issue, which is uh, the pacing of Star Trek, the motion picture. And um, would like to think that by the time uh, you finish reading the book, you can understand that that was the result of a million uh, different factors, including a, lot, a million problems that they had uh, along the way. And, uh, and again, it all starts with the script. And uh, the, uh, the, the script was a, uh, a movable feast, uh, something malleable that was uh, uh, never uh, firmly fixed. I'd like to think that uh, in the, the sane world, well, if, if, can Hollywood ever really be called sane? But in the, the, the Hollywood that uh, Wise had been used to working in, where he was uh, completely thoroughly uh, uh, in charge, he produced so many of his own pictures, and he would have made sure that the script was locked, and uh, as it should be, uh, before they uh, went, uh, went ahead. Uh, but uh, they kept second-guessing themselves, as I say, with all those script changes all along the way. They weren't entirely sure how they were going to end the picture. There were many disagreements about that, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, the, the, I can understand uh, that the film uh, can be uh, looked upon as uh, uh, over long or over large. Uh, uh, and, of course, uh, the... Uh, we, we've probably all heard some of the quips like Star Trek, the motionless picture, and so on. Um, but uh, I don't think uh, that uh, uh, that's the result of any uh, one person, not even the one person that uh, saved the day and enabled it to exist at all, uh, which is the, the way that I keep rubber wise on this project. Well, as I said, it wasn't a critique of his ability. I mean, he's a fabulous director. It's just uh, the, the the track. Well, fact. I don't know what uh, uh, what what you had in mind because you were talking about him having made a musical, and then I see, and he did so much more than a musical. Uh, no, so it, it wasn't that. It was the it, it was just the Trek fans wanted something perfectly Star Trek, and what was delivered to them, they 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 had took a long time to warm to it. And unlike, you know, and just like a, a, the captain goes down with his ship kind of thing, I felt that they kind of looked at Robert Wise and saw if it had been someone else. Now, they don't know all the stories. They don't know what you know. They don't know the background. They don't know how long it took to... Get well, I hope they'll know it by the time they finish yeah. reading the book. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's let's go into that whole aspect Uh because I, I, in effect, I touch on that. I think this is one of the last things in the book was, is uh, that once it was clear that the film was financially uh, a great success, it, it proved what Roddenberry and the fans had been saying all along, which was that there was a, a real uh, untapped gold mine of, uh, of movie possibilities in the series. Uh, and people wanted to have more new Star Trek. Uh, they, this proved that the audience was out there that could make Star Trek profitable. Uh, and it was, it was very profitable for the film. And uh, uh, so I, I never knew who exactly said this, but somebody at the studio uh, apparently had said, uh, well, we're going to keep making it until we do it right. Uh, personally, I think they did it right with the very next uh, film out of the gate, uh, but uh, it's apples and oranges. They made that film licking their wounds from all the mistakes that they had made. They made sure not to make the, the second time around. And um, if you'll, uh, uh, with all due respect uh, to Mr. Uh, Roddenberry, uh, 
they uh, made his participation uh, uh, less uh, the same.